Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harris Lizidakis. Uh, I am the Chief Executive Designate of the World Organization of Family Doctors, WONCA. And I would like to welcome you all in this fifth webinar on uh, COVID-19. Uh, the topic of uh, the webinar today is primary healthcare for universal health coverage. Before we start, however, I would like just to mention how you, uh, the attendees, can interact with us. Uh, so on the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you will see two buttons. The first one is the chat where you can exchange messages that can be seen also from our panelists. And the second one is the Q&A where you can uh, um, uh, put your questions uh, and our colleagues who are monitoring uh, the uh, discussions uh, will convey key points to the panelists during uh, the discussion today. Um, our uh, uh, session will be also uh, live streamed on Facebook and we will be posting the recording on our YouTube uh, channel later on. So without, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our Chief Executive Officer, uh, Dr. Garth Manning. Thank you, Harris, and a very warm welcome everyone to this, the latest in the series of Wonka webinars. Today, the topic is PHC UHC. Wonka's, Wonka has always been clear that you can't have UHC, universal health coverage, without PHC, primary health care, most especially with the Sustainable Development Goals listing UHC as one key goal under SDG 3. So this will be an interesting discussion. COVID-19 has thrown up many challenges for family doctors, and this week's webinar will look at those challenges faced to date and how we can plan for increased preparedness into the future. Today's webinar will be moderated by our president-elect, Dr. Anna Stavdal, and with inputs from our Wonka WHO liaison, Vivi Martinez-Bianchi. We're also especially delighted to welcome two of our senior friends and colleagues from WHO HQ in Geneva. Dr. Benton Mickelson is director for the, in the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases, whilst Dr. Ed Kelly is director of Integrated Health Services. You're both very welcome, and we re we're really grateful to you for giving up your Sunday afternoon to take part. But before I hand over to Anna Stavdahl, I'd like first to hand over to our Wonka president, Dr. Donald Lee, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Garth. Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the fifth Wonka webinar. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. Family doctors all around the world are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. The Wonka webinar is a platform for all of you to share experiences, relay information, and to keep in touch with each other regularly, like family members, urging courage, offering mutual support in these extraordinary times. Next, please. The Astana Declaration of 2018 and the achievement of Sustainable Development Goals 3 are of utmost importance in the pursuit of universal health coverage for every person everywhere. Family doctors provide quality primary care to millions of people globally. We recognize that effective, timely primary care delivery is not only about the doctors. We value working in professional and competent multidisciplinary primary care teams to reach ever greater numbers and population groups. Next. Wonka signed a MOU with WHO in 2019, strengthening our collaboration with WHO at the central level and through technical and policy collaboration and also at regional level and at country level. Next, please. Harris, next, please. Our member organization work with WHO country and regional colleagues on a wide range of issues in which family doctors and GPs have specialist expertise, which includes planning, delivering, accrediting, and monitoring primary care programs, as well as the establishment of and curriculum development for family medicine programs at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Our expertise also includes system development to support effective primary care, 
health security, health emergencies, mental health, measurement and classification of primary care, environment, workers' health, and disaster risk reduction. Tonight, our webinar on primary health care for universal health coverage will focus on the main success factors and the areas of improvement in the primary health care response to COVID-19, as well as ways to increase preparedness for the near future and the next global health crisis. So with this, I'll hand back to Garth, who has made some introduction of our expert panelists already. Garth, please. Thank you, Donald. Um, and without further ado, I will now pass the baton on to Anna Stavdal and her team of experts. So it's over to you, Anna. Of the relationship between WHO and Wonka. The dialogue between our two organizations contributes to integration between public health and primary care in order to reach our common goal, health for all. First slide, please. We have a shared goal, but different approaches reflecting our different mandates. Public health is population-based. Programs are primarily vertical, targeting specific populations or strata of populations due to specific conditions, diseases, risks, or social determinants. Programs are usually time limited. Whereas primary care is horizontal in its nature and is in general person-centered, continuous and comprehensive, not disease oriented, and services are not time limited. We deal with the whole spectrum of age, gender and medical issues. Knowledge about the local context enables the primary care worker to actively use the personal relationship to tailor services to the person and the family. Primary care services are delivered in the community. And that is where public health and primary care should meet and merge to one, in the community. Primary care workers hold a golden position to advocate for public health strategies, it being immunization, family planning, antenatal care, hygiene and nutrition, and implicitly risk assessment with regards to MCDs. Working in the field with the unselected patient population also provides us with an excellent position for reporting back to public health planners on how strategies actually play out on the ground. The vertical programs have a higher success rate if harnessed and advocated by the healthcare workers who enjoy people's trust. A few questions from my practice the last couple of months might be illustrative. Next slide, please. Do you think the measures taken by the health authorities are sensible, doctor? Or how can I believe, how can I behave in a safe way if I need to see my old mother now? She lives alone and her current health is deeply dependent on my visits. Do you believe it's safe to send my toddler back to kindergarten now the restrictions are lifted? Suddenly it's not dangerous anymore. How come? And not least, is it safe to come to your clinic? I understand I'm holding multiple risks, my diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure add up. In its simplicity, these are examples of how people at large relate to public health issues in the context of their own health and their everyday work and family life. I would say that the, the current pandemic works as a magnifying glass. It makes it more obvious where the population-based measures and the person-centered services must be balanced against each other. In actual fact, we are one and the same. We can't succeed without each other. We need the population strategy and we need the workforce to take care of people with and without COVID-19 conditions. Next slide, please. So to maximize the outcome of the different approaches, we need to find common ground analyzing the present 
in order to plan for the future, short term for this pandemic and long term for the next global health crisis. As already introduced to you, we are so fortunate to have three panelists who have prepared the response to two questions. The first one, aiming at taking stock of the current situation. The second, addressing how we can improve, how we can increase preparedness. We will start with the first question. And it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Ed Kelly. He is director of WHO Department of Integrated Health Services. And I would say uh, that you're also a WHO fo focal point for one cup. It gives us real pleasure now to welcome you and the screen is all yours for your first three minutes intervention. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and also uh, Donald, Garth, Harris, everybody. And uh, thank you for welcoming me here uh, and uh, WHO. And it's a pleasure to be with Bento, with whom I'm working very, our team is working very closely these days. And also, people said it in the chat, but a, also a big um, thank you on behalf of WHO, at least, uh, to the world's, uh, in quotes, that is, at-home family doctor for almost all of us, particularly in a period of isolation, uh, mothers around the world. So happy Mother's Day to everybody. So I'll quickly just lay out a few uh, points. Next slide. That lay the grammar for where we are. And um, uh, Dr. Tedros has really talked about how the best defense that any country has, and this is before the outbreak, this is during Ebola, this was during other times as well, is a strong frontline healthcare system, a strong primary healthcare uh, program, a strong primary healthcare uh, workforce, and the, the essential health services that deliver that. Next slide, please. The, obviously, there's huge uh, stress posed by the number of patients with COVID. There's lack of supplies and equipment and burden on healthcare workers. But all of those same things that are happening in sort of the, the delivery system that's focused on COVID right now, it's the same healthcare workers. It's the same emergency rooms. And certainly, it's the same primary care centers around the world that are uh, and family doctors that are uh, managing both COVID and non-COVID patients. So the disruption to essential services in basically every country in the world, whether they've got uh, sort of 100 cases or uh, 1,000 or 10,000 cases has been uh, very similar, really to balance the demands of responding to COVID with strategic planning and coordinated action. Next slide. It would not be a WHO where are we uh, introduction if I didn't give you at least some picture of the global epidemic curve. Um, we have, uh, you can see when the beginning of that curve, as Donald knows well, when we thought things were just really dire was when things were in China and look where we've come. So clearly some nations have taken the lessons from uh, the countries that have responded well and some are struggling to. You could, the cases uh, jumped up um, uh, overnight in the 24 hours, and I expect a bit more. We tend to get the U.S. numbers delayed um, over the weekend, so tomorrow I think will be another jump in numbers and another jump in deaths. Next slide, please. This gives you a bit of a picture of how if this um, kind of curve, a steep rise and then a tapering off happens in your normal quote-unquote situation, you've got in the Western Pacific, uh, that happened with China, but then came back in other countries. Um, it happened, uh, you've got a different shape in EMRA where you have a steep rise that flattened, but flattened deaths are flat. Uh, in Paha, we've got, a, and in Afro, we've got a, a rise that are a little bit off, but you can see shapes of the curve are, are slightly different. So we need to understand this better. And certainly uh, there's a, a lesson about solidarity that I'll come back to. Next slide, please. The role of primary care uh, is quite clear that um, uh, we have a uh, 70 to 85% of cases managed outside the hospital. And there's a whole host of, of activities that really need to be done in order to ensure that uh, effective uh, uh, primary care can be carried on during this time. Next slide, please. But you know, for us, I t in terms of where we are, um, we felt at WHO that we weren't in some uh, sort of uh, new um, 
a picture of uh, primary care and, and uh, a new sort of layout. Really, the, the role in terms of primary care is really to integrate um, this into the overall response, adapt the roles and responsibilities to better respond uh, to COVID and maintain this uh, delivery of essential services. And these, uh, I won't go through all of the details here, but certainly spend a bit of time to look at how these actions need to be customized in your own setting and in your own country. The, clearly, the structures of health systems around the world are, uh, have their specificities, but there's commonalities across all disease programs and all uh, the particular areas of, of work. And for us, this where we are is uh, perhaps uh, it's a new wrinkle on the path we were on, but it is still the path of primary health care at the heart of universal health coverage. And it's just that it's been put more under the microscope because of COVID. Next slide, please. The, this uh, highlights the, the trap path we were on before in terms of looking at how uh, access and quality of essential services, uh, the, the problem of COVID again has shine, shown a light on both of those issues that access is even more difficult now to services, chronic care as well as acute care, and the quality of those services given the inability uh, to access key essential medicines because of supply chain interruptions or having the adequate protective equipment uh, brings it in stark reality. She talked about with the Lancet Commission and with uh, work with uh, Wonka at Astana and, and others. Next slide, please. We have a number of resources that I'll spend a bit of time uh, going through uh, later um, in terms of where the next role. Next slide, please. And uh, a host of uh, complementary uh, pieces that are core uh, guidance elements of uh, health service delivery, both for um, uh, COVID uh, confirmed cases, as well as people uh, with uh, all of the host of regular quote unquote disease burden that we have to manage. Uh, we've got a particular flag right now on long-term care and the role uh, between home care, primary care, hospitals, uh, resident facilities, and emergency rooms about uh, tackling that issue better. Next slide, please. The, that, I think, gives us a picture of where we are in terms of WHO's work to date uh, with uh, some guidance that, for the first time ever, has put uh, the response to essential services and primary care in particular at the heart of the response. It's not a different sort of uh, a set of people or a different uh, activity. One of the pillars, the last pillar of, the, of WHO's work in, in the response is ensuring essential health services at the primary care level. So I think um, we finally got the big machine cranked up and it's just whether we can keep uh, moving. So I'll pause there and we'll come back to the, the, the question on what we could have done better later. Anna, back to you. Thank you, Ed. Um, we go straight uh, over to Bentha and I'm sure we will get back to you with questions and comments. Thank you for a comprehensive presentation. Uh, next one up, Sassie Bentha Mikkelsen. WHO Director of NCD's department. Congratulations on your new post. Um, a hearty welcome to this webinar. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and all Wonka colleagues. I am super intrigued by being invited to this very important webinar. So, and also exciting uh, sort of uh, context for the uh, webinar and I think you have already started to sort of give us a sense of uh, build back better. One thing is what we uh, uh, sort of experienced just now but how can we learn and I really enjoy that perspective. So if I can get the next slide please. So I think uh, this audience knows more than anybody else any other work uh, health force in the world uh, that people are dying mostly from non-communicable diseases, both uh, in, without pandemic situations. And of course, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Anna, the pandemic is kind of an amplifier. So uh, 
during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen, and Ed has also spoken to this, that people living with NCD are more vulnerable to become severely ill with the virus and also to die from a comorbidity with COVID-19. And many of people living with NCD are not receiving appropriate treatment during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see on the right hand slide of the slide, this is sort of the graph that you know from before that we have approximately 70% of the uh, deaths in the world accounting for NCDs. And also, of course, NCDs is the four diseases that uh, make people uh, die too young before the age of 70. So, of course, as in this amplifying perspective, prevention, early diagnosis, screening, and appropriate treatment of NCDs, and very much at the primary health care level uh, to be able to really achieve UHC, fully uh, concur with everything said so far, must be the cornerstone of any global post-COVID response. So there is a lot of material out there. Uh, we have all the official web pages and you will also find more on NCD. Next slide, please. So what we need to do today uh, is really to strengthen governance to be sure that we include NCD and mental health in national COVID-19 preparedness and response plans. As you know, every country is now uh, planning, they are drafting their plans. And uh, through our contacts to the regions, we are not so sure that it's really also taking this into account. So that is very important. And I think from your public health perspective, this is also something you Wonka members can uh, try to uh, influence on. Then there is a need, as Ed has already spoken to, to monitor their access to and the continu continuity to essential health services for NCD. And we will be able to publish um, a survey that is now uh, in uh, the countries because we had very few numbers globally. We have a lot of numbers from Italy, China and from sub-regions and so on. We also need to review the evidence on modon transmission, pathogenesis and disease associations to determine implication for NCD and mental health services and programs, but also the conditions. As you have seen just before the weekend, Peter Piot, who was one of the, those who found the Ebola virus, had himself now a coronavirus uh, disease. And I think just reading his personal journey reminds us that even if you survive COVID, you have uh, a tendency to have uh, a more complicated density of the COVID. So this is important. We need disaggregated data and we need to really understand what is the situation for people living with NCDS and mental health. And as you are very sort of eager to see, we need to have very clear community service um, and guidance to be able to continue essential health uh, and community services. We have raised um, uh, also the need to have clear terminology, and this is especially coming out of our uh, civil society working group that we work very closely with, because there has been a tendency to call it pre-existing conditions, and many of the people living with mental health and NCDs doesn't really associate them with this kind of terminology. You were asking also for examples of success. And what we can see anecdotally is that those countries that really have community-based primary healthcare systems, like in Sri Lanka, in Kerala state, in India, they have been better able to respond to COVID-19 and NCDs. And uh, you see the flow chart on the right-hand side, and this is really sort of telling exactly what was said by the president of Wonka, that the, we need to really look at the frontline workers and it is important that you continue your gatekeeper function, but also that there is a differentiation between COVID and non-COVID, so the continuation of health services can continue. 
So uh, primary healthcare continues to support early diagnosis, screening and appropriate treatment. And also, uh, as was said, uh, give accessible public health information, both to the patients itself, but also I think back to the planning, the, the sort of the governance, the sub regional, the national government on what can be done to really improve the situation. So I will come back with uh, what is the new opportunities uh, in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bente. I mean, we're, we're on time, believe it or not. And uh, with so much information on the table already. Before we start the discussion, um, it's time for our own Vivi Martinez Bianchi. She's been the WHO liaison person for the last three and a half years. And uh, you have prepared a key message in response to the first question as well. The screen and the floor is yours, Vivi. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Family medicine's success in the fight against COVID-19 relies in the adaptability and flexibility of family physicians. The comprehensive and broad training of family doctors has allowed them to serve in any aspect of the health system and adapt to where they are needed. From ambulatory care clinics to emergency rooms, inpatient care, labor and delivery and intensive care settings, the world has seen family doctors stepping up and practicing at many levels during this pandemic. A problem is that even though primary health care should be at the front line in the, in the fight against COVID-19, many countries put all the emphasis on hospital-centered models, often relegating primary health care to the margins, when primary health care should have been at the forefront of a pandemic response. Many health systems close the doors of primary health care practices and repurpose primary health care workers to wherever they thought they were needed. Others sent everyone home and canceled the important work these frontline workers could have been doing. Our member organizations stepped up with informative webinars to inform and train doctors how to care and manage the problem. Family no doctors knew and know that their patients wanted to hear from them and needed continuity of care and adapted rapidly to telehealth, addressing the health needs of their patients through video and telephone visits to prevent or mitigate the collateral damage of isolation and lack of access for mental health services and the management of NCDs. Family doctors entered airways in radios, TV and Facebook Live to inform their communities about how to prepare for the pandemic. Some started working with municipalities as advisors or with health departments organizing contact tracing. Next slide. Family doctors and their teams set up drive-through COVID screening tests and ambulatory acute care COVID clinics. They continued vaccinating children and adults and providing care for non-communicable and communicable diseases to those patients who needed to be seen in person. They created hospital at home programs, like the one picture in Peru, with teams monitoring the health status of patients with COVID at their homes and others providing care for the elderly in extended care homes. Lack of enough testing supply is a problem. Lack of PPE, and even hand sanitizer in the health centers is a serious problem for healthcare teams in many countries of the world, in low income, middle income, and high income countries alike. This is causing severe burden of disease and death for healthcare workers and other essential personnel who are not being provided the essential equipment they need. We need this equipment also in primary healthcare settings. I do not want to see any more of my friends and colleagues die from a preventable problem if they would have had access to PPE. The pandemic has uncovered deep inequities in access to services, inability of full families to shelter and isolate and get appropriate food and even water, inequities linked to social determinants of vulnerability and poor health. The bigger successes are not in deploying family physicians into the hospitals to support intensivists, internists, and surgeons, even though we are able to do that. As coronavirus spreads, the biggest and universal successes come from investing in the frontline 
with well-resourced primary health care teams working at the community level. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. Um, we will now go into discussion. Um, before uh, we start the discussion, I will introduce the rest of the webinar team today. We have three monitors with us. Uh, Shabir Mosa, he is the African Regional President. He is monitoring the chat channel. We have the Regional President uh, of the East Mediterranean Region, Jinan Usta, monitoring the question and answer channel. And we have Anna Nunes Barata, the Young Doctor Representative on our Executive to monitor the Facebook channel. So they will now channel to me input and questions and Shabir, I would like you to now get ready in a short while to pose a question from your part. Uh, while I kick off the discussion with, with this question, and it goes to, to all three of you. Because to me, and that's not only in the pandemic, but it seems that a default reaction to, to challenges in healthcare or other places seems to be to reinvent the wheel the eagerness to establish new services when faced with a threat, instead of looking at what already exists or what we have, we know can function and we have to build. Um, so instead of ad adapting the existing services to, to the current needs, we are eager to invent new ones. And that is the huge advantage, of course, of primary care to adapt services to local needs, how to make sure that experience from the front line in the current situation is channeled back to public health level to plan for a better utilization in the next round, now in this pandemic and a next one. So who will start? I, 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 uh, I would like all three panelists to, to reflect uh, on this. Are you are you ready? Yeah, maybe you you want to start. That's fine. I think um, I have this in my what to do next uh, slides, but uh, I really think there is a need for recognition of what primary health care brings in regards to knowledge. As frontline workers, as people who are connected with the community, we can start seeing trends before they become the big numbers. In my experience, I, I have known of outbreaks in factories, in plants where um, many patients are being diagnosed with COVID-19 five to seven days before it becomes the news. And so we are the ears, we are the hearts, we are the people who are connecting with communities who are coming to tell us what's going out there. So we have an opportunity to be connected more with the decision makers and those who are talking about what are the practices and laws and policies that should be put in place. There is a disconnect that for future pandemics, for the present pandemic, we should be connected and, and be listened to, and, and if not advocate for our organizations, or our members to actually be connected with the public health sector in the region, in the country, and also be able to uh, uh, share our um, expertise. With your use, Ed. Yeah, I'll come to you then. No problem. Over to me? Yeah? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't, the, 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 the audio broke up just as you were uh, assigning it, so I was conveniently hoping someone else jumped in. No. Um, yeah, I think this, uh, um, uh, it's a, a very uh, important question, and I think one of many lines of discussion that have happened um, uh, across countries in this outbreak has has been, you know, whenever something like this happens and countries find themselves flat-footed and, and many places uh, sort of all of a sudden making these realizations of big, big gaps in where they were spending energy and time, um, obviously there were, there were uh, thoughts around 
uh, around kind of the essential public health functions and universal health coverage and primary health care. And I think um, we should, as uh, Wonka and WHO, as organizations that exist to, to support both of those uh, kind of worldviews of public health and preparedness, but also, you know, essential services and, and the move towards universal coverage, but there will definitely be a push from those who are wanting to return us to the disease focus, um, sort of unique focus on preparedness and IHR, as if it's a zero sum game. And I think we have to be very careful. There was a, there's been several discussions in the media around all these um, highly touted universal health coverage systems in, in Europe. And look, they, they fell apart. They weren't able to deal with it. They've been making the wrong investments and it's not about UHC, it's around something else. And I think that um, we have to be very loud and clear that this, it's not that we spent too much focus on primary health care and UHC, it's that we haven't spent enough. That is one of the key lessons that's come from, from this outbreak, that, that the front line was not ready with all the supplies it had, uh, it should have had at its disposal. Uh, to take to take this on, the functions still need to be there. I think we can submit to that take home message. <laughs> this music, music in our ears, <laughs> anyways. Bente, let me hear your views. I think I will start with uh, just here and now. As I mentioned in my, uh, uh, you know, in my sort of intervention in the beginning, is that you can do something just now try to influence on the national preparedness plans that are actually just going on just now. Because I think there is a need to immediately sort of come out with all of the experiences, even if it's not summarized, evaluated and so on, it's ongoing. So, so that's, that's sort of number one. Uh, number two for me is very high level politically, but it's extremely important. And uh, for non-communicable diseases, which is really cross-cutting and not very disease-specific in its uh, nature. We had a breakthrough, I would say, in uh, UN General Assembly in 2018, where we, for the first time, got really good commitments from uh, heads of state and government linking together emergency and non-communicable diseases. And I'm saying this because we, we all know it's a huge divide sort of politically funding wise between humanitarian and development. So actually, Anna's and my uh, home country is the first country ever that have put non-communicable diseases into their development strategy. And this is sort of very high level political things. But for Wonka, I think you can be very vocal on this, that we need to continue to uh, really bridge between humanitarian and development, between emergency and uh, chronic diseases and chronic conditions. So these are very uh, important. So then the uh, sort of last point maybe just now is that I think um, many countries are now planning evaluation of their uh, immediate response. And I think it's extremely important that we have people from all levels and all uh, parts of the uh, healthcare system involved in these evaluations. It is a tendency that it's very few nurses and midwives and family doctors. There is very often focused on the very, very high-end experts on virology and so on. So I think this is also an extremely important uh, thing. Lastly, of course, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, what, what we are prior, prioritizing now in WHO for non-communicable diseases is, is, is exactly UHC for NCD at primary health care level. That will be our focus for the coming year. So this is also, of course, a preparedness in itself. Thank you. Thank you. This confirms that we, we have common goals. We share the goals. Um, Shabir. Um, are you ready for a question to our panelists? Yes, um, I just want to share this that um, lots of uh, the people in the chat are actually echoing that sentiment that it's very easy for, um, for primary care to be marginalized as Muslim uh, says in PHC being marginalized hospitals. I think it's echoing what's been said earlier. 
Uh, I mean, the question that came up quite at the outset, it was a comment uh, made by Huda about what's going to happen about financing. You know, where are we going in the future with financing? Um, WHO has put out, uh, you know, things like prime health care needs to continue and yet the governments are not quite following that. Um, it's actually very likely that financing will shift the same way into all the high-tech care around hospitals. Is there any plan by WHO to address this financing of gen health care in generally and particularly primary health care? I think that's an utterly important issue with uh, UHC. We'll, we'll give them a short rest uh, before you are responding to this. No problem. Yeah, um, I'll, Benton may want to add to this, but I mean, for WHO, uh, our main guidance around sort of finances at, in regards to COVID, actually our main guidance overall is that there are some important adjustments, adjustments that need to be made to, to make frontline care delivery and actually community and outreach care, I'll come to it in my second set of slides, safe, but otherwise, the the world should not suddenly twist on a new COVID axis. We need to keep the funding flows going for all of the work that, that we have there. We need to keep immunization programs going. Many, many more children will die of measles than, will, than the entire set of deaths uh, worldwide on COVID. But the, fi the financing shift on high-tech care, there is some recognition that in some you know, member states that they have, um, uh, that there has been Almost all member states still spend tons of money at tertiary level and much less at primary care and almost nothing at uh, sort of public health and preventive services, et cetera. But there is some recognition within that, um, that financing that's gone to tertiary care uh, that it has been very inequitably uh, delivered and that you have big rural sections of your country that have very poor access to uh, secondary hospitals or any hospital access and I think that it's an opportunity for examining that but I think it's an opportunity for examining the sort of the integrated uh, delivery of care across the continuum and looking at serving populations and, and panel populations with the full set of needs and I think that that's been uh, the strong message on financing the only shift that we have made is the to ask that countries um, just do away with user fees at the point of care to encourage uh, proper care seeking for COVID and for other uh, diseases. Bente, anything to add? Yes, I think again, you know, it's all coming back to governance. So, um, I mean, the reality seen from non-communicable diseases is that if we had been able to prevent those before we had a, a COVID pandemic, we would probably would have been better off. And this again comes back to funding because we know that this uh, sort of um, problem both within nation, um, within um, uh, countries, but also of course in the whole overseas development assistance is that uh, the world biggest killer is not funded and domestic funding is not necessarily going into chronic disease. So, so this is again, you were talking about amplifying and I, I, I think I, I would like to use that again because you know, this situation exactly amplify what we know is ongoing in peacetime and we see it even more in this time. So that's sort of one comment. The second one is, that we can see that many donors now reprofile and they want us to reprofile as well the work we do. And the good thing is that um, several donors are now coming up with new funding and so on. And again, coming back to governance, I think that's where we need to be uh, having also NCD and mental health and communicable diseases as well in the preparedness plan so they can actually benefit from these funding streams as well in this very specific COVID time. So these are the two things. So it's all about governance. It's about understanding what is needed. And then it's also to be especially vigilant, I would say, in these times. And the best way is to be reflecting what we think is necessary in the national, but also sub-regional, sub-national uh, preparedness plans over. Mm. 
Thank you. Uh, good reflections, ideas. Um, and uh, we will now close this part because this, this points ahead, doesn't it? So now we'll go to the second question. If we can have the slide, um, Paris, and here we go. How can we plan for increased preparedness for the coming months and this pandemic, as well as the next global health crisis? We have already, of course, touched on this, but we will have another round of short presentations from our excellent panelists. And we will get, go back to you, Ed. You will uh, kick off this round as well. Um, so I'm sure Harris will find your slides and we are ready for another three minutes. Good. Well, um, uh, thanks again. And, and I think, you know, this question of, of what we could have done better, um, uh, anyway, I guess a few of you have heard uh, maybe somewhere um, in the news that there might be those questions floating out there for WHO and also for many countries. Actually, um, one of the speeches that I, I live in France over the border and one of the speeches that I have enjoyed recently, I thought it was one of his better speeches in his entire presidency, it was the first speech that uh, President Macron made. Um, and he fully acknowledged that that uh, he, his task force, and the, and the government have not been perfect in this very unprecedented uh, global health crisis. And I think that's fully understandable. The issue is um, trying to move as quickly to address those gaps and transparency about what the gaps are and how they can be fixed, uh, I think is important at the global level, but it's very important at national, even more important at national and local level. But for WHO, I'll just highlight a few things and flag um, uh, setting it up maybe for some of the work also for Bente. But, um, and we have a, I have a full slide, a set of slides that we'll make available, I think. I hope Harris and others can speak to this afterwards. Um, uh, Garth can speak to this afterwards too about how those will be available. But basically, WHO's focus has really been on um, in, a, in a number of areas. So first, the research and development. We brought a group together. Uh, in January that looked at the at starting quickly on vaccine work, but not just vaccines, on therapeutics, on diagnostics, and then on uh, some of the very important lessons learned. And a few of the chats have come up um, about what are we learning about what countries are doing at primary care level that are innovative and could be emulated. And we have a team that's working on gathering that. We'd be very happy to connect afterwards for those of you who'd like to work with us and take part uh, in that lessons uh, learned uh, approach. Helping countries prepare and respond, obviously, is part of WHO's core work for its emergencies program. And this point that Bente raises about to be involved around response plans, I think is very important. I think one of the lessons we learned early on uh, is that the response planning was very, um, how should we put it, at, at global level, but certainly at national level, most countries were very close hold government, very high level of the government reporting to the president and very little involvement of civil society, uh, sort of medical associations and others. And I think it's really time to try and crack into that, um, find out who's on that task force, talk to them, try and set up meetings to give perspectives from the front line. Um, those people in almost every country are spending 24 seven time in, a, in, a, in meeting rooms and on phones, which is great, but uh, they need the perspective of the frontline workers about where the gaps are. Um, and we can't expect them to shift policy if we don't tell them where, where we're doing we need to do better. Coordinating the global response is one of our jobs um, and we have a partner platform and I just want to flag on the national plans and the international approach. Uh, like I said earlier, there are eight pillars that are related to uh, prefer, uh, preparedness and response, lab, work on laboratories, work on infection prevention, work on essential supplies, etc. And the, the ninth pillar is ensuring essential services. So it is part of the response itself and um, it's a fundable area. Uh, the, and uh, there are three main documents out there that are guiding that global response. First is WHO's Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan, SPRP. The, next, uh, the second version of it has just been released. There's also the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which is a focus on uh, 20 plus um, uh, FCV from fragile 
uh, conflict affected and vulnerable states and those focus on those states and vulnerable populations. And the third is the framework for addressing the socioeconomic uh, impact of COVID. And that uh, guidance document um, was launched uh, two weeks ago. Last Monday, the Secretary General met with all resident coordinators in all countries to discuss that. And the main, the one link between all three of them is uh, ensuring essential health services. So the, the whole primary care agenda is really the link between these big pieces. Those are all funding opportunities. There was uh, nearly seven billion put forward for addressing the, the humanitarian response. Uh, there's even more for the um, for the UN framework in terms of an ask. So that's a big opportunity at country level to to make a difference on that. Obviously, we need to do more work um, on essential medical products and communicating about how people can protect themselves. I think it's quite clear that what we didn't spend enough time on with countries and all um, was the whole uh, community mobilization and involvement of civil society and on ensuring that there's a big push now on getting supplies and diagnostic tests. Um, the Secretary General has made available the UN's entire supplies work, which is the World Food Program, UNICEF. It is a multi, multi-billion dollar operation with multiple 747 jets flying around the world, bringing supplies that we thought only about COVID and have not thought enough about the PPE, for instance, the a colleague from Nigeria flagging that needs to be also made available. So our, at WHO level, WRs have the clear message now that when they're thinking about um, all the supplies they need, they need to think about also personal protective equipment for, uh, for COVID, et cetera. So next slide before I sort of wrap up here. I think it's just really to come back to this uh, issue that we had uh, talked about that, you know, here is, uh, it was heartwarming to see it in the earlier uh, slides, um, uh, the vision that we had coming out of Astana. Uh, it is sort of, um, if we hadn't already been taken, we could have used now more primary healthcare now more than ever. Uh, right uh, in this particular uh, phase of the work on the virus. Um, but uh, it's quite clear that the big challenge that will now face countries as they're shifting um, the, the, how they're managing these public health measures, as they're trying to, uh, op I just spoke uh, to through the UN um, disaster and risk reduction uh, platform framework to uh, set up small businesses, about businesses reopening reopening, that has to happen, but it, um, we need to think now, not just of physical distancing and, and hand washing and these kinds of things uh, only, but um, uh, and how many cases we have, we need to think about how able we are in different countries for the primary care system to function normally as cases will rise. And for sure, nobody's really talking about this, but cases will definitely rise. You saw the Western Pacific numbers there, and I think it brings home a last message that I'll close with on that is at the heart of primary health care, which is solidarity. The, it's only one country, but it's being played out in many other countries. Singapore, which has a very st a strong health, anyway, many on the call know it better than I, but a very strong health care system has reacted very robustly in terms of managing the outbreak, um, has good testing capacity, um, and managed it quite well, had a re-outbreak. Uh, a second big second wave because of uh, migrant workers uh, who are sort of outside the healthcare system, outside of the regular testing capacity, and uh, are their vulnerable population. So this will happen in every single country uh, that unless we also uh, target the vulnerable and come together in solidarity within the spirit of primary health care, uh, it'll be a very long time before each and every country controls this. Thanks. Oh, no. Can you hear me? I, I, I lost my pointer here. Yeah, here I am. Okay, Bentha, over to you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Ed, for giving, you know, the really big, big picture. Um, so, seen from NCDs, and you may re sort of recall, I guess, the reason why Wonka asked NCDs to come is because we are probably... Uh, the kind of diseases that um, occupy most of your time in uh, as family doctors. 
So we think that uh, NCDs can act as a kind of a spearhead to really build the bridge between, you know, the national COVID-19 response and utilize the best buys, the way that we can prevent NCDs in this situation. So building the bridge with the primary health care and UHC as the foundation. And as I briefly mentioned in my reply to one of the questions as well, we see that there is a missing piece actually. We don't have UHC benefit packages defined for uh, NCDs and not specifically on primary health care level. And we can see that there is fatigue because we, we have, as I said, best buys, we know what to do. We have a toolbox that countries know of, but since it is not uh, sufficiently uh, both sort of been defined but also integrated at primary health care this is something we really want to provide and of course raising the priority given to continuity of care uh, of health services and I have to say that one of the really good things that has happened uh, at least in WHO during COVID is that we now are working together regardless of program diseases conditions and we are looking at what does it take to give continuity of health care services we will come out, as Ed said, with uh, guidance on this, and I think this will really be something that is appreciated by the family doctors because it's, um, it's meant to be very practical. So on that practical level, it's important, but it's also important that we continue to push for these things through the international agendas, including in the UNGAs and the World Health Assembly. Um, as you know, the member states will be discussing uh, COVID in the virtual World Health Assembly 73. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, funding and fundraising and also being sure that we are funding these kind of health systems to take care of the broad uh, amount of patients. So, of course, reprogramming is very important, but maybe calling for new international funding patterns and revisit, I would say, the Addis Ababa uh, uh, accord coming out in 2015 before the SDGs were uh, agreed, where domestic fun funding and financing was at the forefront with the countries at the steering wheel. I think this again shows that there is a need for doing this. It's also a need for building new partnership for NCDs. So from the NCD community, we see positive uh, development when it comes to private-public partnerships, but there is also a concern that we have an undue influence from tobacco and, uh, and alcohol industry trying to define themselves as essential products in this very difficult situation. So then, of course, and there is also new opportunities to implement WHO guidance on resuming health services and activities for health and well-being. And there is definitely uh, an opportunity to develop systematic approaches for digital healthcare solutions. We see that this is now happening extremely rapidly in, uh, in, in uh, I think, at all levels of healthcare system. But there is also a need to really look carefully into this, so we are not, um, uh, so we are not sort of um, by accident, I would say, increasing the inequity uh, and sort of accentuating the social determinants of health. We need to involve the ministries of health in the revision of the social, economic and environment policies and further investment for health. My last slide is just to inform you that we have uh, specific working groups at three levels of WHO, so very importantly, uh, uh, representatives from, especially from regions, speaking, some, speaking on behalf of the countries. And we have defined the eight most important things that we need to focus on. So, of course, an advocacy strategy to really be sure that we are uh, speaking um, clearly about non-communicable diseases and also try to um, mitigate for all the false information out there. 
mobilize uh, action to include NCD in national preparedness and response plans, and then reinforce all the preventive care. Because I think it was Anna or somebody talking about public health in uh, in sort of the the mix of the pandemic. I think we we must not forget all the preventive care and all that needs to go into health and well-being. And it's maybe even more important than ever to have strong voices for this. Then we need to identify key epidemiological and research questions and also to identify um, uh, innovative solutions. So that's what we are doing. We also try to add uh, NCD specificity to efforts to maintaining uh, essential health services. And we need to mobilize action for uh, access to medicines. We uh, try to you know, map out where the big pain points are. We know that, for example, access to insulin is a problem, but also access to palliative care. And we work together with the whole organization to see where is the biggest need to respond. And then there are still a lot of questions, uh, as I think was flagged from earlier interventions, on very specific things, on cardiovascular diseases, on diabetes, on, uh, of course, on, um, on cancer, on access to cancer therapy, and so on. And this is uh, at the core of WHO as well as a normative health agency. So through this working group, we, we work very closely with the civil society working group under something called a, a the um, uh, global platform for NCD and uh, even more maybe or not more important but as important is also to work with the UN interagency task force with 26 different UN agencies that feed into the same sort of eight uh, priority tasks. So I will collect all the, uh, the sort of inputs from this meeting as well and uh, try to reinforce the actions that we are now developing in the response of COVID. So thank you. Thank you, Benta. Thank you to Ed and Benta. I mean, a lot of words and concepts here. Uh, we are happy to hear about and to work with you on a lot to respond to as well. But Vivi, you have, you have your message to the second question now before we go to a discussion on some of many of these points which have been raised. So please. Thank you. Uh, increased preparedness requires investment in primary health care and in community resources. The next crisis, the present crisis needs primary health care, family medicine organizations to be invited to decision making and disaster response centers. Funding to strengthen primary health care and an increase in the number of family doctors and other members of the healthcare team trained so that every country is ready to provide the universal health coverage that is needed in COVID and non-COVID times planning for primary health care to be able to meet the needs of each country and territory. We need to really assess what is needed on the ground at the front line to be able to meet the needs of the population. Primary health care needs to be counted in humanitarian aid and global health planning and budgeting. Without primary health care, the outcomes of this and future pandemics and disasters will be worse. Health justice demands affordable and equitable access to health care including testing and treatment for COVID-19, as well as accommodations and support for more routine, but equally life-threatening physical, mental, and behavioral health needs. We need to look at things with a health equity lens. Family physician-led primary health care teams with empowered patients understanding what is going on, breaking silos, and providing innovation in data and technology with data integration. In other words, Health information exchange between hospitals, primary health care, labs, practices, and health departments. We have to have a better coordination to understand what is going on, which are the hotspots in the community, and how do we work together to make things better. We need adequate PPE for protection and testing supplies at the primary health care level so we can take it into the community to understand the true prevalence of disease in, a, in the community if we want to save more lives. 
We need regional, national, and international collaboration and taking away the political diatribe and discourse out of this serious situation. Next slide. Multi-sector collaboration. Primary health care collaborating with public health and community stake stakeholders to enhance COVID and future responses. When united, we are stronger. The frontline has many of us working together with other essential personnel and other people that are making this. This is the life of many of us and many of other partner organizations and essential people who belong to multiple cultures and groups. A community spreading disease such as COVID-19 needs a community health response, something that family doctors are well prepared to do. We have to work together at this front line to be able to make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Bibi. Uh, we will now have a second round of discussion. And I will invite you, Ana Nunes Parata, a young doctor representative, to uh, present us with a question from the Facebook ch uh, channel uh, or from you. Um, and if you can also think about who you will address this question to, because we only have time for one uh, reply to uh, or comment to the question. So hello everyone. So this will be difficult um, to address the questions just for one person. Um, it's been quite active in the Facebook uh, group, but I would like maybe to pinpoint some key messages in terms of how in eventually the WHO could encourage the development of partners, of partners in less developed countries, because how to implement comprehensive primary care, mostly in this sector, Think in the less developed countries, as was shown be, uh, before, that has a, a very high mortality also when it comes to access to healthcare or not adequate healthcare as well. Um, maybe just and then adding a point on the best resource documents and references to describe primary health care practices, mainly in this COVID situation, as to how we could find them. Um, first, so, so, um, I think, yeah. I think the first part of your question, um, re repeat it please, and then the, um, Ed can, because WHO was called for here. Um, you can, yeah. you can, <laughs> first come, first serve. Uh, okay. so the, the first, first question, Anna. Okay, so the first question would be, uh, how would can WHO encourage development of partners to focus on implementing comprehensive primary care in less developed countries? And maybe which are the best resource documents in this uh, time of the changing COVID situation in terms of primary care practices? If I would summarize it in these two points. Before yeah. Go on. Perhaps I could, uh, before you go and add, uh, I've got a very sure. similar take. Perhaps I can add that and then you can answer both. Um, in fact, it's a very similar kind of feedback that came from the chat group as well, where people felt that there's, a, you know, this, this marginalization of primary health care, as was said. And I think you noticed that and responded with a document as reference, um, which I'm going to just mention is the COVID-19 operational guidance for maintaining essential health services during an outbreak, thank you for that. I had a quick look at it, and in fact, I have uh, I've been meaning to look through it. One of the paragraphs in the first, in the introduction, uh, talks of many routine and elective services may be postponed and suspended. In addition, you know, and it goes on to talk about that, but it's become almost a reason for many governments to shut down services. And, uh, you know, almost a knee-jerk panic reaction um, Richard Botello asked the question, is there not a possibility for us as WHO and Wonka to consider in the same line that I think Anna has just raised now, for us to consider joint exercise in actually spelling out a much clearer process in preserving both uh, in, 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 um, in addressing COVID, but also to establish stronger health systems rather than shutting down as is implicit in this document. 
Okay, Ed. So you are challenged here, and um, it will get even worse because you will have <laughs> one one minute <laughs> to yeah. Yes, in this very, and I'd be very <laughs> pleased to, yeah. The good thing is that you can pick the part which you want to respond to. So please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually at WHO, that means you pick the easiest part. But anyway, I think, uh, with thanks to Shabir for framing it uh, there, I think, I mean, firstly, the, um, the, the guidance in terms of what it says, definitely. So uh, uh, does not say don't. Uh, seek care for essential services. It does not say shut down essential service delivery. As a matter of fact, it says this, it, um, this is going to be a core part of your response. You will not be able to sustain the response to COVID unless you keep essential services running. But, um, you know, people have heard also the message around, around the physical distancing um, and the stay at home uh, measure. And it's become sort of like mixed in people's minds that people say, well, Thought they told me to stay at home, but am I supposed to go if I need my services? And so we are working right now, and that's really a like a risk communication uh, effort, as as well as being a technical programmatic management and, and and strategic management of health services. So we're working more even this week on on stronger messages for say, for instance, malaria endemic countries. It is not okay for someone to stay home with a mild fever for a while and see if they develop COVID symptoms. You need to be able to seek and access care. Um, and unfortunately, many countries that are in that situation also don't have great telemedicine options and sort of promote uh, consultation options. Um, so that it is an issue that we're trying to address more. We have three key guidance documents around that Bente mentioned earlier. First is this one that I, that I referenced, and actually that's the page where all of them sit. Um, the first is, this pro, you know, quick programmatic uh, high-level guidance for countries on what you should, uh, the key actions to take in terms of ensuring essential services. The second is one that just came out last week, done jointly with, um, and I'll paste it in the chat, with uh, uh, UNICEF and um, IFRC on ensuring the, the effective delivery of community-based uh, and outreach services. So that's, um, that's another important, very, very important, and it goes through very specific disease uh, areas. And the third is a guidance that we're coming with now, which will be delivered in about a week and a half, that goes through disease area by disease area and population by population, with the very specific adjustments to make to ensure the continuity of those uh, services. But I think um, that uh, this whole idea, just to close, um, that... I really think we have an opportunity on primary health care. Uh, if you look just at WHO, it is the first time, this third guidance I mentioned, the first time since my, uh, actually ever, but definitely since I've been there, and I've been there a, a bit of time, where we have brought every disease program, HIV, PD, malaria, NCDs, neglected tropical diseases, and all the population programs together for one guidance. And it's because they realized that in this context, uh, it's this essential services around primary care and, and also essential, you know, tertiary care services as well that um, occasionally that that need that need to be taken in a whole uh, way. When I worked in South Africa years ago, uh, we were launching some new guidance for quality standards on primary care and hospitals. And the the head of the disease program work uh, came. I was there with this WHO and said, "These are great standards, but my my disease program people don't see themselves in it." they are definitely seeing themselves in primary care now. And I think that the, we have to, um, it's the great unifier, and I think we should uh, approach, uh, try and approach it that way and keep everybody on board. Fantastic. This, <laughs> this was, this was smart. Bente, you will, you will maybe be the, the recipient of the last question. I will allow to run five minutes over time because we have a third monitor. Jinan, are you there? Yeah, hi everyone. Actually, the question is for Ben. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is about uh, if you have any success stories about uh, uh, collaboration between private and public sector in overcoming NCDs, especially in COVID times. That's for you. It's, it's tailored to you, Bente. Mm -hmm. 
So thank you very much. And I think that fits very well with the second question that Ed didn't really respond so much to either. And it was a question about how do WHO partner with other partners in low and income countries in, in uh, low and income settings. And I just want to mention this, that um, Dr. Tedros has been very proactive. So he did a WHO investment case. He is setting up a WHO foundation. We have a framework for how to work with uh, non-state actors, including primary, uh, sorry, uh, private sector. So I think sort of, if you look at WHO now and compare with five years ago, we are really sort of uh, able to uh, partner with so many different organizations. And I have seen this coming around now after Dr. Tedros took uh, office. We have um, uh, MOUs with FIFA, with the international food and beverage industry, and so on and so forth. And of course, we can see that in this time of COVID, we have a lot of offers from the private sector. So uh, I think it's mostly coming true in the supply chain, sort of uh, pharmaceutical um, products, but of course, through uh, the collaboration with CEPI, also on development of vaccines. So it's especially in this area, but we have also a question in our survey Survey. If also the private sector uh, health um, and the, the healthcare providers also are sort of offering uh, new kind of things, we can also see that in the digital health area there is a lot of private sector engagement. I'm sure that Ed could speak to this. We have we have, have had to set up actually mechanisms, which is a positive thing, on. Um, innovations on uh, apps that are under production and so on and so forth because there is a need for a clearinghouse and all these positive development also have to be very carefully paired as i said uh, initially with the same vigilant when it's come to conflict of interest management so we uh, are not sort of crossing any red lines with all the kind of industry that have a negative influence on people's health but I think uh, all in all, we can see that it's all hands on deck. Uh, we saw all kind of partners want to really partner and we are ready, I would say, with WHO because we now have the frameworks in place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, there are many clues here for us to, to come back to together. Um, I will not go into to the details now, summing up. I will have a slide on the screen, please, Harris. Um, and I think I'm even more um, sure now than when we started this webinar that we can submit to Richard Horton, Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet and also an expert of global health. And let him sum up what we have, I mean, basically said. The pandemic is an issue of global health security. There is no global health security without individual security. And what is individual security? It means strong primary care. Strong primary care is an absolute prerequisite to defend us against this pandemic and future pandemics. It is the first line of defense. Thank you so much, especially to our guests, to Vivi as well, who have prepared presentations. Uh, I am personally looking forward to, to uh, work with you in the years to, to come on behalf and with Wonka colleagues. I now hand over to Donald for your um, concluding remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anna, and thank you, panelists. Uh, before I make my some concluding remarks, I'd like to do some advertising, is that next Sunday we will be talking about rural practice. But first of all, note the time. It's at 10 UTC instead of noontime, so that's three hours earlier. So please tune in next Sunday, but at an earlier time. Next slide, Harris. Next slide. So the webinar will enable 
rural doctors to describe how they are preparing for protecting against and dealing with COVID. The session will allow sharing of initiatives, limitations and concerns and explore how rural health systems prepare for the future in the COVID era. So please uh, <clears throat> join us if you're interested and have time. So next slide, please. Thank you again, panelists, for offering so much information, resources, and discussions. Uh, I would like to share some thoughts about the way forward from aspiration to reality. Three points I just want to make. The first is we need to continue to develop congruent conceptualization of primary health care through policy. So what does that mean? Inclusiveness, everybody involved, national policies. There is always a concern of selective primary care where we are actually maybe focused on specific interventions, on vertical disease programs instead of overall uh, <clears throat> a concept. So likewise, indicators and measuring progress, we need to look at it from this angle. I think our panelists have shared a lot of insight into this, a lot of discussion, <clears throat> advocacy, and also inclusiveness. And I like, you know, some of the speakers always use all, all, all. I, I think that's very important. Likewise, the second point is the capacity building of primary health care teams. There's concerns of selective team members, but we are a team, as I said at the beginning. It's a primary health care team. And in the past, there has been a lot of discussion whether community health workers are enough, sufficient, or maybe from Wonka. We always just talk about family doctors, but actually not so. We believe in the team. So again, this capacity building should be the whole team. And lastly, which has been touched upon, and which I won't go into too much, finance and resource allocation, of course. Some of you may know, but most would have forgotten there's something called 20 by 2015, advocated by Wonka earlier, you know, uh, many years ago, asking the health budgets of you know, individual uh, countries should devote 20% of the health budget to <clears throat> primary horizontal primary health care programs. And now we're working on a paper with John the Messonnier of Gant University, 30 by 2030. So that's something that we will present. So next slide. So to conclude, as ever, we are the first in, last out professional group serving our patients as best as we can. So do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contribution to tackling this world crisis. Next, please. No one knows what we will face in the weeks and months ahead, but everyone knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our own interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. So may we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you very much. Garth, back to you. Thank you very much, Donald, and thank you to all the panelists. We really, really appreciate it. There's a lot of very good feedback on the chat, on the chat screen. Um, as Donald has said, join us next week for an absorbing webinar on rural issues in the time of COVID-19. It'll be led by Bruce Chater, chair of our Working Party on Rural Practice, with panelists from various parts of the globe, and including Professor Michael Kidd, former president of Wonka, and now principal medical advisor and deputy chief medical officer for the Australian Department of Health. And as Donald says, the, the webinar next week is at 1000 GMT or UTC. So please note the, the earlier time, but I hope very much you'll join us again. So thanks again to the panelists. And, but for now, everybody, you know, have a good day and stay safe. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you very much.